One thing that really does underpin the marketplace at the moment is really the lack of stock being delivered. Approvals and delivery are two different things. Certainly when I look at what is being produced out in the market, it is ridiculously low. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, a code cracker. We're going to dig into the headwinds and tailwinds of the Australian property market. Uh, it's a coin toss. Is it going to be good or bad? What are we going to talk about today? Let's power through it. You know the rules, guys. Uh, play the show in double speed, get your life back, and all the episodes are done in lessons on real estate. So let's go through it. Are there more pros or cons to the Australian property market? I certainly think compared to other asset classes, Australian real estate is performing quite nicely. If you look at, for example, tech stocks or things like crypto, really uh, the they're getting kicked to the gutter at the moment when it comes to their asset value. In fact, when we analyze deflation, quite often more speculative assets do quite well. And we saw that when money was deflating to a worthless level, crypto was skyrocketing. Now inflation is unfolding. More volatile assets get repriced with inflation. And of course, for crypto, it is at an all-time low because once you price in the real cost of money, which we are now seeing, assets like that struggle to perform. However, real estate has pricing power. It is a roof over someone's head, so it carries a little bit more of a need logic. But there are certainly headwinds and also tailwinds which are connected to the real estate economy. Now, Unlike the share market, which has dropped significantly, tech stocks are down significantly. Atlassian, for example, is down like 30%. Crypto is off like 75%. Australian real estate is actually performing quite well. In fact, this year, if you analyze from start to, to finish, Many markets are still at break even or even up in value. I said this earlier uh, this year that growth would be front loaded f during the first half of the year to really shield the second half of the year. And that's really what has unfolded. In fact, um, you know, if you look at the average dwelling value in Australia, it's still up around 4% from the start of the year to the finish of the year. However, certainly some marketplaces are overpriced and I do see some signals that assets will be repriced in the market. I was just down in Eden. Eden is a little weird fishing village in the middle of nowhere. It rather emulates Lake Weirdo. Yes, I think I found a fishing village which is Lake Weirdo. Uh, Eden in New South Wales, in the middle of nowhere, has 3,000 people. Basic economics indicates that for a town to be self-sufficient, you need a minimum of 7,000 people. The town is dying. However, if you were to go online today and look for an average property inside of Eden, you could be paying up to $900,000. Is Eden overpriced? Yes, is the answer. Rather like crypto. Real estate is the underlying asset. Real estate is based on location and of course the land content and building design of the real estate. A location like Eden with a population that can't even self be self-sufficient is a place where real estate should not be $900,000, but it is. 
it will probably be repriced. For a lot of Australia, the real estate market is too expensive. But of course, when we go to good locations with underlying fundamentals behind it, the dip in value in real estate will be short-lived. And of course, when it comes to its true worth and being repriced inside inflation, we are seeing simply a mild adjustment. Now, of course, when it comes to the idea of deflation, Australia had been deflating when it came to the cost of money all the way back from its last high in 2008. Obviously, COVID created an artificial look and feel of what a cash rate is being basically worth zero. Now, we're getting back up to more normal periods of time where money is typically borrowed at five and a half to six percent. Interest rates are up, but don't forget that Australia's real estate market is kind of the bedrock of monetary policy inside of Australia. So there is a potential for the cash rate to go up a little bit further from where we are today. It's possible that there will be two to three more rate rises before we reach a ceiling where the Reserve Bank overshoots. But what we need to understand is Australian real estate is where Australia's wealth is kept. Residential real estate is a $9.5 trillion asset class. Australian superannuation is $3.5 trillion. Australian stocks closer to three trillion, commercial real estate closer to one trillion. So for most people inside of our society, they need their real estate to be performing at a certain level. And of course, banks are invested in Australian real estate. Government is invested in Australian real estate. So eventually this stuff tends to pass. The most important lesson, though, we can learn right now compared to other asset classes, Australian real estate is performing the best. It is beating stocks. It is beating tech stocks. It is beating gold. It is beating crypto. It is actually performing pretty well. So the cash rate will potentially, uh, you know, continue to go up if we look at where The banks thought we would be at the end of uh, the year in December 2022. We can see uh, CBA was actually reporting a 2.6% cash rate, so they were kind of wrong. Uh, The NAB Economist was 2.85%. Absolutely correct. So well done, NAB. Westpac had uh, reported that um, we would be shooting towards 3.35% cash rate by February. And the ANZ economists were at 3.35% cash rate at in November. Um, And that didn't unfold. So we can see the banks are pricing in um, some concepts around uh, where money will be. If we look at the long-term 10-year bond rate, it the market is pricing in around a 4% cash rate. So what does that mean? We should probably think that money is going to cost about 6% to borrow. So we are in what I would call a very resilient period for the right type of asset in Australian real estate. Eden, Lake Guido, I don't know if it's going to be repriced. It should be. In my mind, it's overpriced. It's too expensive. When you can go to a really good suburb in a really good city and today buy a property much cheaper. So if we look at certainly the resilience of Australian real estate, it has been through a lot over the years. It's been through things like GFCs, credit booms, credit busts. Uh, mining booms, mining busts. It's had plenty of 
headwinds and tailwinds before. So let's think about the headwind. The headwind really is the cost of money. That's it. There is no other major headwind that we can see on the horizon. Obviously, if you study money, you could study it from the point where the cash rate was a tenth of 1%, or you could go back to a similar period where money costs the same amount. But depending on when you borrowed, obviously, your interest rates change. And of course, the amount you can borrow also changes if you're getting into the market. Today, the borrowing capacity for a person out in society has dropped because of the idea that the cash rate has gone up and therefore the bank rate has gone up as well. Today in Australia though, certainly we have to break down the groups of people who own real estate into different categories. We have people who own their real estate outright. We have people who've owned their real estate for a long time already and have a low uh, amount to pay off their mortgage. Then we've got obviously the investors that work on real estate by carrying a rental return. So they get both uh, growth, but also get rental returns. And of course, then we have people new to the market who are, for the first time, uh, experiencing things like inflation unfold. Obviously, for us inside of Australia, household income to buy real estate is something that gets analysed. And for even for many people who borrowed recently, they also, when they took on a loan, were serviced with a metric whereby the lender had to impose three extra percentage points above the interest rate that they took on to approve the loan. So what we are seeing across the marketplace is though household income is stretched, it certainly isn't at breaking point. Of course, if you look at the marketplace, which is probably the most sensitive to household incomes, it's Sydney. Sydney's property values make up 51% of people's household budgets. So 50% of everything that comes in goes out to be put back into property. If you look at, for example, other marketplaces, it's closer to 35 to 40%. Even in places like Darwin, where property values are very, very cheap, it's under uh, 20%. So in real estate, what that tells us is if, Uh, Sydney is kind of the metric of what is considered probably a stretching point. Many of the other marketplaces are well below that stretching point. So uh, I guess when it comes to some of the headwinds, we need to consider that some fixed rate loans are coming off their uh, loan fix. And of course, In 2023, over 90% of fixed rate loans are due to expire. So they were fixed rate loans that were two to three years that they got a really good rate. um, And now they are coming back into a much higher rate marketplace. The theory with fixing at such a low rate, and certainly many of my clients fixed at such a low rate, I did as well, was it allowed you to save money that you would otherwise pay into a loan and watch it disappear. So in essence, what is happening, though media would say it's quite scary to see someone who perhaps has a 3% mortgage jump to a 5% mortgage. In theory, for the last three years, that person or that family structure has actually saved a bucket load of money 
by fixing their interest rate. That money just doesn't disappear. Hopefully that family hasn't, you know, pissed it up against the wall, so to speak. But most people, if we look at their household savings, have actually improved their position. In other words, people are coming into a higher rate marketplace that have fixed with more money, not less money, to combat the situation of the marketplace. Now, if we look at some of the tailwinds supporting the Australian real estate marketplace, there are certainly more tailwinds than really the one headwind which pertains to the idea that Australian real estate today costs more to uh, service by the virtue of what it costs to borrow money. So here are really some of the tailwinds. We've got to understand Australia is a AAA rated economy. It is a well-regulated economy. It has well-regulated financial systems it is a large diverse economy. It has highly skilled jobs in it. It is a economy that people want to move to. Moody's uh, forecasts Australia and the Australian economy will be resilient into the future. So it is a very lucky place to be an investor in. It is not... Um, you know, a basket cased economy. And of course, what this does is allow us as property investors to have a little bit more rain over what we do because the fundamentals of the economy of Australia is considered by world standards to be very, very good. When we analyze Australian real estate, we know that around 80% of the overall trillions of dollars of Australian real estate, over 9.5 trillion Australian real estate, uh, 80% of that is equity. Only 20% of that is debt. And so when we look at the assets and liabilities of the actual marketplace, there is far more asset value to it than there is liabilities. And of course, this goes back to most people who own real estate are actually people who have paid off real estate or well and truly uh, close to being debt free on Australian real estate. And of course, some of the more, most expensive Australian real estate is in the hands of much older people that don't uh, have leverage. And of course, that means... Um, for the most part, that asset class is very, very safe. So we need to understand that Australians have been saving for quite a long time. Um, you know, obviously, when the cash rate drops to zero, it means you've just got more money in your bank account. And we can see that today with where the flow of money is impacting the property marketplace. We can see that the interest component of most loans out in the marketplace are, um, you know, uh, the, the largest part of, of the loan. Principals have been paid off and offsets have been topped up. So what we can see from what is occurring, there are very few mortgage arrears unfolding and very few mortgagee sales. So overall, the health of the marketplace is still quite strong. And again, if you own real estate in the right asset a class inside the right marketplace, really, it's just a little bit of buying time before things start to probably go in the direction of more growth down the track. So there are really nine healthy positions we need to understand when it comes to Australian real estate. The first one is Australians are very wealthy. Like we are one of the most wealthiest people per capita on planet Earth. 
our net worth is huge. And though, of course, sometimes you may not, you know, think you are fundamentally wealthy, by world standards, Australians have more net wealth uh, than anyone on earth. The average net worth of an Australian is around $570,000. So if your net worth is worth that, you've got certainly a pretty good asset um, value and no doubt against your liabilities, for the most part, a lot of people inside a property have equity. They have the ability to manoeuvre their real estate assets. So um, even if interest rates keep going up a notch, there is still very, very, very low levels of, uh, of really debt inside of the real estate marketplace. Now, I think when we talk about, obviously, interest rates, we've all got very short-term memories because if we look at today's rate, it really mirrors rates, uh, you know, back in sort of 2013 and 14. You know, for people who have been in the real estate marketplace for a long period of time, a rate which is where we're at today is very, very normal. But certainly for a lot of property investors or a lot of people thinking about property, obviously there is this kind of peak to trough kind of mindset. They look at where rates were at a tenth of 1% where they are right now and think they are high. But again, it really just, if you're going to measure peak to trough, you're constantly going to be disappointed because that's not how the real estate market works. The real estate market is a, a long-term vehicle. So you've really got to measure it over more than just one or two years of peak to trough money movement. You can go back, for example, to the 1990s. And if you really want to go, well, where was the last peak of money? It was at 19%. Uh, there is no way the current level of inflation warrants an interest rate as high as that. So, of course, when it comes to understanding this stuff, it is really, really critical not to fall into the trap that uh, you compare things to some sort of peak to trough. It, you need the long-term mean to really understand what the true value of what things should cost when it comes to understanding money. So obviously, savings is a big part of where Australia is at at the moment. And we know that Australians have been saving more than ever before. When it comes to household savings, household savings to income ratio is really quite good. Um, we are seeing that there is more money in people's back pockets and therefore, ultimately, that usually means there will be a corresponding viewpoint on spending, the ability to service, obviously, debt. As I alluded to, mortgage stress is, is consistently low at the moment. If we look at, for example, NAB's Consumer Stress Index, it is still very, very low. Like people are not in high levels of stress when it comes to their, uh, you know, message to the marketplace. So you could go back to quarter two, 2014, and stress levels were much higher when it comes to where consumers were when it came to lending money back then than they are certainly right now. I think the next section we need to understand is supply. Supply has fallen off a cliff. One thing that really does underpin the marketplace at the moment is really the lack of stock being delivered. Approvals and delivery are two different things. Certainly when I 
look at what is being produced out in the market, it is ridiculously low. Supply levels are at a critical, critical juncture. We're now seeing the media start to report the absolute train wreck which is unfolding that there's just not going to be enough properties for people to live in. And of course, today we are starting to see the real challenge behind this and it's going to get worse into the future because really what we are starting to also see is the rebound of population growth. Today, Australians are living longer, but more people are starting to arrive. And of course, with huge amounts of international migration back, we're starting to see thousands upon thousands of people pour into the country. And, uh, you know, in October, the one of the latest reports on permanent and temporary skilled visa arrivals was close to 100,000 people arrived in October. That's amazing. So, uh, you know, if you start to go, well, holy cow, there could be a million more people here within sort of two years or so. Australia's got a real problem on its hands because of its population growth. And, of course, you add that to natural growth in Australia's birth rate and the fact that people are living longer, there is a looming shortage of places for people to live on the carts. It very much is going to unfold. And of course, we can see that in the rental crisis, which is here at the moment. Most cities now, the rents are climbing because there is just a shortage of available properties to use by the rental market. You know, some cities are literally down to hundreds of properties left to rent, not thousands of properties. And of course, you take a city like Melbourne with 5 million people and there's a couple of, uh, you know, 100 properties available to rent, you've got a real problem on your hands, let alone, you know, places like, Adelaide and Brisbane and Hobart and Darwin, where, of course, um, you know, there is a lack of stock as well. The whole country is undersupplied of real estate. Of course, places like Melbourne are playing a little bit of catch up because of things like COVID and the pandemic and the lockdowns. But, you know, interesting enough, I mean, that marketplace has gone from a 4% vacancy rate now down to under 1%. It's pretty crazy in a pretty short period of time. So when we look at a global index of where the vacancy rate is at, you know, Australia again performing above the rest of the market. I mean, if we look at Los Angeles, it's at 3.5%. New York, 2.5%. Uh, you know, if we look at I don't know, the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, you know, you're at let you're at 0.8%. Uh so depending on where you know the asset is, I'm seeing a lot of statistics showing suburbs, the right suburb today is less than 1%, um, which is just terrifying. That means a tenant literally, you know, leaves and a new tenant moves in within literally two or three days, like you would literally be getting the property cleaned and someone else would be jumping into the asset. So I'm sure you can do some Googling, you know, rental crisis is real folks. Like there is uh, today reports from media coming out that, you know, landlords will be increasing rent by up to 20%, which is staggering. So then you go, well, let's break this down, right? you know, a million more people over the next couple of years. Australia needs uh, around, you know, uh, 100,000 dwellings every year to just keep up with where things um, have typically been. So to produce 100,000 properties is a bit of work, right? So you can imagine if the average 
family formation is 2.5 people. You've got an extra million people coming over the next couple of years. Let's call it four years. That's 250,000 people a year at 2.5 people per dwelling. That equals 400,000 dwellings needed over the next four years, 100,000 dwellings minimum per year, which in itself is going to require a bit of work because I don't see 100,000 dwellings being produced over uh, the course of the current year. Like when I look at stock levels, I'm looking at Melbourne's producing something like 5,000 apartments. Like when you think that 60% of uh, the marketplace is living in major cities like Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane and Perth, when you study the data, there's it doesn't add up. There is more people, there is less properties being produced. Now, if you think about it in terms of uh, blocks of units, you know, to produce 50,000 units, you need uh, 500 blocks or 1,000 blocks of units being produced with 50 apartments. Now, if you drive around major cities, you won't see 1,000 blocks of units under construction. You might see, um, you know, one in every fifth suburb being produced. The construction is not happening. And so in my viewpoint, there is a real, real challenge when it comes to supply. At a basic level, Australian real estate is driven by supply versus demand. And of course, if you look at some of the other tailwinds pushing the economy, it's certainly the unemployment rate. We are at an all-time low. Anyone who wants a job can go and get a job pretty simple to do um we are at you know three and a half percent that may rise because really it can't fall so the only way uh the only direction it's going to go is up it's not going to go down because uh you know that for in every society there is certainly a group which just can't participate in working um you know there are people just unfortunately that can't work So you're never going to get a 0% unemployment rate. Um, So Australia's jobless rate is going to remain pretty strong between 35 to 4%. And of course, for a lot of uh, jobs now, wages are increasing. You know, I was talking to a guy the other day, he got a $10,000 bonus the day he started just by signing the contract to take the job, a $10,000 bonus for signing. Uh, that's, you know, that stuff's pretty, um, pretty crazy, right? And obviously shows the strength of the market when it comes to the jobs. So obviously, um, you know, we've seen certainly interest rate rises in the past and they have not crippled the real estate market. Uh, interesting one, which, you know, really does sort of showcase what can happen. In uh, October 2009 to November 2010, we had a 2.75% basis point increase. The real estate market in that first year went down by 4.1%. Second year went down by 1.2%. Within five years, the real estate market had risen by 26.1%. If we look at 1999 to 2000, we had an interest rate climb that year by two point uh, uh, by um, 250 basis points. The marketplace actually went up 14%. The year those basis points. Um, unfolded 33% within two years and within five years, 64%. So the idea that interest rates are cooling the marketplace is a good thing because it's creating a reprieve, particularly for anyone who has yet to buy. In other words, it's creating opportunity for people 
who need to get into the market to have a go. But will the real estate market sit idle forever? Well, history suggests otherwise, that historical rate rises actually are followed by historical periods of growth. That growth, if you like, happens short and sharp, but we can see that every time the market has gone through a rate increase, within five years, the marketplace has gone up, in some cases, up to 64%. So the first two years of the rate rise are a bit subdued, but then things start to bounce again. And for a lot of property investors, that bounce is what they need to be ready for. Now, the rate rise has near on been going six months. I would say we've got 18 more months of stagnation and then, you know, it's kind of game on. So if you're a property investor, you sit tight, you move your money around, you try and get a better loan, you try and negotiate a good price of your loan. If you're yet to buy and you want to get into the market, well, you look at the opportunity as a reprieve on prices. In other words, if rates were going down now, prices would probably be going up. And in some respects, I'd prefer to pay more for the money monthly if I was buying at the moment to get a better price than just paying more for real estate and borrowing money at a cheaper rate. So what are the price catalysts for a drop in real estate? Like, Let's just throw it on the table. If we look at the levers that are getting pulled, do we see interest rates dropping the value of real estate? Yes, I think we can all agree that that is one possible lever to drop the value of real estate. In fact, Eden should drop in value because it is an overpriced market based on rates going up. However, not all places are overpriced based on rates going up. If we look at the ability to get credit, Is it easy to get a loan right now? It's actually very easy to get a loan. In fact, uh, despite the idea around serviceability assessments, borrowing money is not a problem. The marketplace is not deleveraging. Money is still readily available if you can qualify to borrow it. Uh, There is no LVR drop. There is no um, gate being put up by banks you are not getting locked into a 70% LVR or an 80% LVR. For most investors, they can still borrow a handsome amount of leverage. There is no deleverage. Deleveraging, in my view, is where the real estate market really corrects because if no one can borrow, then you've got a real problem on your hands. People can borrow, it just costs more to do it. So if we look at... The levers that are affecting the real estate market, certainly deleveraging is not one of them. Are we seeing huge amounts of job losses? Not happening. Obviously, if there's job losses unfolding and people have million dollar mortgages, you've got a problem on your hands. The economy is producing more work than there are people to do the jobs. So job losses are not a problem. There is no catalyst to real estate values falling away because of job job losses. Are we seeing off the back of, for example, job losses, income drops? No, we are not. Uh, What can happen is when a society goes through a lot of job losses, that usually means productivity drops and incomes drop. We are not seeing that. Are we seeing an oversupply of real estate? No, no. We are not seeing that either. Real estate is very much undersupplied. Are we seeing a lack of demand? Demand has certainly fallen away, but for every property out there, there's still two or three buyers. There's not 20, but when there is 20, that's too many because it pushes 
the real estate values up too far. So when we look at the levers that are unfolding out in the economy, really there is only one lever, which is probably a headwind, which is the rise of interest rates to soften inflation. When we look at the uh, tailwinds, there is really an undersupply, there is no income drops, there is no job losses, and there is certainly the ability to leverage, and there is a half-decent level of demand. In fact, when we look at the auction clearance rates, the demand level is still fairly reasonable at 60%. So properties are selling. And of course, uh, when we look into more of the tailwinds propping up the marketplace, it's probably fair to say yields are a big one. They are growing, which certainly makes property investment more appetizing for people who are yield-based investors. We know the government is pro-property ownership, so they're certainly doing extra things to help people into the market, shared equity schemes, you name it. We know that Australian real estate still offers great tax advantages to property investors. Uh, We've been through the negative gearing wars inside of Australia, so we know that uh, the government is sharing the burden for property investors to, uh, you know, buy an asset and, of course, uh, rent that asset out. We know from a tailwind point of view, long-term migration is a big thing for Australia. It needs to reach basically around 40 million people by mid-century. So we know if we control an asset, there is going to be more people down the track for that asset than there is today. And obviously, there is no deleverage. Markets are very fluid. They're full of equity. And we do know there is a huge wealth transfer of aging Australians who will eventually pass on huge amounts of money tied into the real estate market in the 2030s. So we know there is another transformation on the cards down the track. And then, of course, we've got other special events, things like Olympics, Rugby World Cup, Commonwealth Games. There is so much happening when it comes to making sure Australia stands out from the crowd. And of course, uh, I think today there is still the aspiration for the great Australian dream. People want to participate in the Australian real estate market and will participate in the Australian real estate marketplace. So overall, other than buying in Lake Weirdo, I think getting into the real estate market is absolutely a good thing that there is rates which are creating a reprieve in the marketplace. Uh, I can tell you if rates were lower, prices would be higher. So you do the maths, um, but certainly if you've bought your portfolio and you are now just in that critical hold phase, you know, look out for a really good rate, check out some fixed interest rates, think about what you can do, speak to your brokers. There are some awesome ways to reduce your monthly cost to run your portfolio. All right, folks, that's it for me today. I'll catch you on the next episode as we talk more real estate. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.